Hi guys, in this video we will be learning about the theory of plate tectonics and the evidence that supports it. To begin with, we're going to look at the structure of the Earth. And the Earth is divided into three main regions, being the core, the mantle and the crust. So the core can actually be divided into two separate regions, which is the outer core and the inner core. And then we have our mantle, which is this big section here, and the crust. So I'm just going to go into a bit more detail about the properties of these different areas. Starting with the core, the core is made of dense rock. And these include iron and nickel. It has the inner core is solid, but the outer core is actually molten. So this means that the rock has been heated up high enough because there are really, really high temperatures in the core, which means the rock becomes a liquid state. So alongside that, the temperature of the core is more than 5000 degrees Celsius and it's heated from two sources. One is called primordial heat. And this is heat that's been left over when the Earth was formed. And we also have radioactive heat. And this is from the radioactive decay of some elements in the core, such as plutonium. Then we have our mantle, which is this section in red here. And the mantle is molten and also has parts of it which are semi-molten and it is mainly composed of rocks containing silicon and oxygen. And finally we have our crust, and our crust is the lightest part, or lightest part of the structure because of the elements it contains in it. So the crust is solid, because this is the part of the earth that we actually live on, and it contains many elements, which include, for example, oxygen, silicon, aluminium, and sodium. There are other elements, but I've just listed the main ones. And it varies in thickness. And this is because we have things like mountains and oceans, so the crust varies in thickness because of these landforms. So where we have continents, the crust can be about 30 to 40 kilometers deep. And in the oceans, the crust is only about 6 to 10 kilometers deep. The upper area of the crust and the upper mantle can also be described as the lithosphere and the asthenosphere. And these are more new categorizations of the layers of the Earth. So the lithosphere, which contains the crust, and the upper rigid section of the mantle and the lithosphere is about 80 to 90 kilometers deep from the surface of the earth and this is divided into many large tectonic plates so that's one important thing to remember and then the asthenosphere which is labeled here as plastic is the molten part and this is the layer below the lithosphere, well, molten and semi-molten. And we can think of this as the layer that the tectonic plates move around on and float on. So the tectonic plates float on this. And we're going to look at tectonic plates in more detail later on. But all we need to know is the lithosphere is made up of the tectonic plates and the asthenosphere, which is below the lithosphere, is this area of molten rock which the tectonic plates float on. As I just mentioned before, tectonic plates are in the lithosphere and we have two different types of tectonic plates and they can either be made up of continental crust or oceanic crust. And we need to know about these because they're very essential for the formation of landforms to do with plate boundaries and this because they have very different characteristics. So I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of their characteristics and how they differ. So continental crust, which is pretty much the continents where we have land, the crust is much thicker. So it's about 30 to 70 kilometers deep, 
whereas our oceanic crust, which is under the oceans, is only about six to ten kilometres deep. The continental crust is really, really old, and it's about more than 1,500 million years old, whereas the oceanic crust is much newer in comparison, and it's just less than 200 million years old. The other thing we need to remember is that continental crust is lighter than oceanic crust. So these are the densities. So the continental crust density is 2.6 and the oceanic is 3.0. So what we need to remember is oceanic crust is denser than continental crust. And finally, they have different compositions. So continental crust is made up of granite, silicon, aluminium and oxygen and oceanic crust is made of basalt, silicon, magnesium and oxygen. And one point we can take from this is that oceanic crust contains basalt and that is why we'll learn in the future that some of the magmas produced from oceanic crust are called basaltic, such as basaltic lavas, which is when volcanoes erupt. So this is where this word basaltic comes from, and it's just because this element is, or rock, is present in oceanic crust, and that's why it's described as basaltic. But we don't need to know much about this now, but you'll see this word crop up later on. Moving on now, we're going to look at the theory of plate tectonics. And this is a theory that was published by a man called Alfred Wagner in 1912, and he proposed that the formation of the continents didn't always look like this and that the continents have moved into these positions and he suggested that the continents actually used to be in this formation as a supercontinent and he called it Pangaea and he proposed that the continents have moved into their current position through the process of continental drift and this we can see is the current formation of our continents and the continental plates that they sit on. So we have seven main plates, which are the Pacific, North American, South American, Antarctic, African, Eurasian and Australian. And then we have smaller plates, which is the Arabian plate, Indian, Nazca and the kind of Caribbean plates over here. So at this point, Alfred Wagner had not suggested how these plates moved and how the continents moved, but he suggested that they had moved. And that's what's important to know about his theory of plate tectonics. And he had a lot of evidence to prove that the continents have moved over time. And this was part of both geological evidence and biological evidence. So some of the geological evidence that he proposed was that because of the fit of the continents. And this was the main reason why he proposed this theory. And that's because, as you can see, he noticed that the coast of South America looked like it fits into the side of the coast of West Africa and that was his first reason for suggesting the theory that it almost looked like a jigsaw puzzle. The other bits of geological evidence we have is that there are glacial deposits which were made 290 million years ago that are found in South America, Antarctica and India so on the map we can see South America, we don't have Antarctica on this map, and India up here. And he just thought, if these glacial deposits were all made at the same time, how have they ended up in such vast locations away from each other? And this must mean that the continents were at once together, and since then they have split apart. And the last geological evidence is that the same rock sequences have been found in Scotland and Canada. And as you can see, Scotland is way over here in the British Isles. And there's matching rock sequences over here in Eastern Canada. So Eastern Canada and Scotland must have been joined together at some point. We also have some biological evidence, and this is to do with animals and plants. So similar fossils from similar species have been found in India and Australia. And as we can see, we've got a massive ocean between these two. So they must have been connected because the same animals have lived in the same region at one point. Then we have 
Mesosaurus fossils, which is almost a alligator type animal, which is extinct now, which lived on the planet millions of years ago. And the fossils of this animal have been found in South America and South Africa. So this is another reason why they think these continents were joined together at once. And lastly, the same plant fossils have been found in Antarctica and India, meaning that their climates must have been very similar at one point, so they must have been close together. As I mentioned before, Alfred Wagner's theory did not mention how these tectonic plates moved, and this is why there has been much development of the theory of plate tectonics. And the reason behind this, as has been discovered, is due to seafloor spreading. So we're going to look at this in more detail. So many years after Wagner produced his theory, some scientists discovered this ridge that runs up the middle of the Atlantic, which is called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and they decided to investigate it in further detail. And on exploration of this ridge, they found that the crust on either side of the ridge suggested that seafloor spreading was occurring. So this involves a molten material coming up from the mantle, pushing up between the plates. And as we can see, we've got one plate on this side and one plate on this side, and therefore it's forming new material in the middle. And as more molten material comes up, the plates get pushed to the side. And this theory of seafloor spreading has been ratified, which means kind of substantiated, because of these bands or strips. And I'm going to go into these in more detail. But this links to the magnetic field of the Earth. And the magnetic field of the Earth switches from time to time on regular intervals. And this is roughly about 400 thousand year intervals and this means that the magnetic field switches from the north pole to the south pole and the molten material here that solidifies to form the oceanic crust contains iron particles and these iron particles are attracted to the magnetic field of the earth so when the magnetic field is normal and is at the north pole the iron particles will align themselves to the north and when the polarity switches to the south pole they align themselves to the south but when the oceanic crust is set and hardens they are trapped in that formation so scientists could see the alternating bands of crust with different polarities of the iron particles shows that the oceanic crust has been spreading over time and new crust is forming. So this theory of sea floor spreading proves the theory of continental drift and is the reason for continental drift. I'm going to look at this in more detail. And just one thing to point out relating to age. So because the new rock is being produced in the middle here, this means that this crust over here is older. So the further away from the mid-Atlantic ridge, the older the crust will be. Now, this suggests that the Earth might be growing, but this is not the case, because where we have boundaries between plates where crust is being created, we also have plate boundaries where the crust is being destroyed. And these are destructive plate boundaries. So here, crust is being lost, and at constructive boundaries, which is what the mid-Atlantic boundary is, crust is being made. So constructive, made, destructive, lost or destroyed. So this means the earth is growing, but it's staying the same size. And now I'm going to show you why this happens. And this happens due to thermal currents in the mantle, also known as convection currents. So as I mentioned before, there are some radioactive elements within the inner core and the outer core, and these cause convection currents. So when the magma is in the mantle is heated, it rises, and when it cools, it sinks. And this is what is the convection cycle. 
So here we are going to get our constructive boundaries, which is the ones where the crust is spreading apart because the heated magma is coming up and is pushing it apart. But when the magma starts to cool and sink, it actually drags down some of the crust with it on the other side. And this is where we get destructive boundaries. And the process that is the pulling of the crust down back into the mantle where it's melted again is called slab pull. Because of these convection currents in the mantle and plate movement, we get a lot of landform produced at the plate boundaries. And I'm going to go through some of them, beginning with ocean ridges. So the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is an example of an ocean ridge, and we looked at that before. And these has happened, as I said, at constructive plate boundaries, where the plates are moving away from each other, and magma is coming up to fill the gap. And the lava, or magma, just to point out, magma is what lava is when it's still within the earth and is in the mantle, and once the magma reaches the surface, it's called lava, but they are essentially the same thing. And the lava, or magma, is rising here, and forms a ridge in the middle of the ocean. And this can also lead to the formation of submarine volcanoes, which just means under the sea volcanoes. And this is where plumes of magma are coming up and are being erupted. So those are our ocean ridges at constructive plate boundaries. We also have these things called rift valleys. And rift valleys are very similar to ocean ridges that we looked before but these happen on continents instead of in the sea and they also happen at constructive boundaries but on continents so they're pretty much the same as each other and this happens when the plates on the continent move apart and an area of land in the middle sinks down and this causes a valley to be formed so it's quite a simple process and where we might have two valleys on either side of each other, say another one here, this bit of land that's in the middle between two rift valleys is called a horst. And that's just a keyword you need to remember. An example of a rift valley is the East African Rift Valley. And these pieces of crust here are pulling away from each other and our rift valley is left in the middle and there's lots of tectonic activity around this area. And what is proposed that if this keeps happening, as it will over thousands and millions of years, this part of Africa will actually move away from the main continent and we will get an infilling of sea between here where the Rift Valley currently sits. But this won't happen for thousands of years because the plates are moving at very slow rates. So yes, we might end up with a new ocean between the east of Africa and the mainland. Our third type of landform is a deep sea trench and these occur at destructive boundaries. And as I said before, destructive boundaries are those where some crust is being lost. So this goes from the process where we get an oceanic crust and a continental crust meeting and they are moving towards each other. And because of the different densities, and I mentioned this earlier on that it was very significant, the oceanic crust is denser. So if we say this is our oceanic crust and this is our continental crust, it's also shown on this diagram, because the oceanic crust is denser, it will sink beneath the continental crust. And when it sinks back into the mantle, it melts. And this is shown on this diagram here where our oceanic plate is being subducted beneath our continental plate. And this forms deep sea trenches. And an example of this is the Marianas Trench, and this is the deepest trench in the world. And we can see it on this map here. This is our trench. And at these trenches, sometimes we get the formation of island arcs, which are another landform. And this happens when the oceanic crust, which is being subducted back into the mantle, it melts again at a point called the Benioff Zone. I'll just label it here. 
and this is the point where the oceanic crust melts. And the melting oceanic crust actually has a lower density than the rest of the magma in the mantle, and it rises up in plumes to form new land along the surface. So as we can see on this map here, we have our trench, and then we have these islands that are being formed from the solidification of magma rising up from the trench as the crust is being subducted. And obviously this will happen over thousands of years. And finally, we have a feature called a young fold mountain. And this also happens at destructive boundaries, but this is happening where continental crust is meeting continental crust. So in our trenches, we had continental meeting oceanic crust, but this is continental versus continental. And remember, they will have similar densities. So when the crust is coming together, they will actually end up being pushed upwards and not one being subducted beneath the other. And this is going to form mountain ranges as seen here. And a common example of a fold mountain, which is the resulting impact of this uplift here, is the Himalayas, which is a huge mountain range with the tallest mountains in the world, notably Mount Everest. And this is a photo here. And this is where the Indian plate has collided with the Eurasian plate. So I'll just make a note of that, Indian and Eurasian. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level geography resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. See you soon and together let's make A-level geography a walk in the park.